Hi, my name is Gary Friedman, and welcome to the Friedman Archives blog. Today I'm going to talk about some unobvious things about the Sony Alpha 6300 that you probably won't find in any online reviews. I discovered these while writing my in-depth, best-selling ebook on the camera, which I refuse to promote in this video. Much has already been said about how great this camera is. It has the best autofocus of any previous Sony camera, especially for follow focusing. It has stellar image quality, and it can even shoot 4K video as long as your shots are less than 20 minutes in length due to overheating. Uh, let's start with something you probably already knew subconsciously. A lens that almost all 6300 owners have is the 16 to 50 power zoom, which is super tiny, super convenient, and they even squeezed in a silent zoom motor and optical stabilization. And yet, it's still sharp while exhibiting relatively little distortion at the wide end. How in the world did the engineers do that? Well, the answer is, they cheated. This lens actually distorts pretty heavily, but the average user will never notice it because it's either fixed in the camera when they make the JPEGs, or programs like Photoshop and Lightroom will fix it for you when importing your RAW file, but they will not tell you about it. And it's a feature you can't disable. Have a look at this test shot using this lens. The first is an out-of-camera JPEG, and the second is a RAW file, which was opened in Lightroom. They look pretty similar. Distortion's not too bad. Now have a look at this third shot, which is open using a third-party software called Raw Therapy, a program that has no corporate agreements with Sony and therefore is not obligated to correct for the distortion for you without your knowledge or consent. Okay, so is this a bad thing? Is Sony being evil? The answer is, a lens snob might think so, but an engineer would think, you know, if you can fix certain things in software, it relaxes the constraints for design you have to work with in order to get a great performing low cost product. Besides, Leica's been doing this on their high-end cameras for many years now. So if it's okay for them. <clears throat> anyway, the engineers were not being deceitful. They were simply being smart. So now you know. The next thing I found was a very positive surprise. If you've been following my blog for any length of time, you know that I place a great deal of emphasis on good light, more, more so than I do at shooting at high ISOs. But sometimes life just kind of happens and you have to make the most of it. One night, for example, I was shooting a friend of mine at night in a small, dark area lit solely by the light of a Starbucks sign. I ended up shooting at the camera's highest ISO value, which is 51,200. Nobody will ever look at this shot and say, wow, okay, because the light is awful. But hey, it's a snapshot and you know, snapshots have their purpose. Usually the best way to tackle high ISO noise is to shoot it in RAW and then to reduce the noise later on on your computer, which could produce superior results to the watercolor effect you usually get with in-camera JPEGs. And as a small footnote, I should mention the watercolor effect that everybody hates. It looks horrible when you pixel peep, but it was actually designed to look best when you printed your picture at a 4x6, like at a one-hour photo place. So that's where that came from. Anyway. After I spent considerable time on my computer cleaning up the images from that night in Lightroom, I had a look at the out-of-camera JPEGs that produced at the same time, and I was gobsmacked. These are a tiny bit better than the images I had spent so much time cleaning up by hand. The out-of-camera JPEGs were now as good as what I was able to get manually. This is a first for Sony. Nobody's talking about this, but they really should, because the out-of-camera JPEGs from this camera are now better than any other Sony camera ever, and that's saying a lot. But you'll find the greatest difference at high ISOs. Cool. Next, I found a bug. Just one bug, mind you, but it's pretty incredible considering the camera's complexity. It's the flash exposure lock feature, which was designed originally for situations where the subject was too small for the flash metering to expose for properly. Have a look at this example. These were taken with an older Canon camera many years ago. This feature evolved for situations exactly like this, where your subject wasn't front and center, and therefore the camera wasn't too sure what to expose for when deciding how much flash to output. And you use it just the way you use the auto exposure lock button. You fill your frame with your subject. Why don't I actually show you? There's a picture frame here. So let me show you how it's used. Here's a picture. I'm gonna to try to take a picture of it and use a flash exposure lock feature with the flash. The way you use the flash exposure lock is you first you have to assign it to a button. 
In this case, I've assigned it to the C2 button on the A6300. And there's two different versions. There's a flash exposure lock uh, hold and a flash exposure lock toggle. I've used toggle here because I don't like holding buttons down, especially if they're not in convenient locations. So the first thing I'm gonna do is press the flash exposure lock toggle button. What it'll do is it'll put out one pre-flash. It'll measure how much light comes back and then it'll decide how much more or less light has to be output. And then it remembers that for the time you actually take the picture. You'll notice that in the lower right hand corner of the screen, you can see the uh, uh, lightning bolt and then the L, meaning this is a flash lock, it's now re it. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to recompose. First I'm gonna focus, lock, recompose so the subject's in that tiny corner of the screen and then I'm going to shoot. So here's what I discovered about that. When you use the flash exposure lock with the ISO set to auto, it tends, to auto, it tends to overexpose by about two stops. Have a look at that. Not acceptable. The fix is very easy. What you do is you change your ISO to something other than auto. In this case, let's just set it to 200. I'll fill the frame with my subject. I'll press the flash exposure lock button again. You can see a pre-flash went off. The lock, the flash exposure lock icon shows up in the lower right-hand corner. I'll now focus, recompose, and shoot, and much, much better. So there you go. Finally, I like to spend some time clearing up what most new owners find confusing in their new camera. All the different focusing modes, and when you use what. Now, if you've seen some of my previous videos which explain this, you can stop watching here because this will be just the same as what I've done in the past. The first thing you should know is that the camera has baked in a whole bunch of phase detect autofocus points right into the sensor. There's a gazillion of them. Let me show you how just one of them works. And I'm gonna isolate it by hitting the function button, going to the focus area, and switching to the flexible spot small. It's the smallest you can actually get, a small point. See that little square in the center? That's what it's gonna focus on. So let me go to the very, very center. There we go. Even though it says phase detect versus contrast detect, you should know that all autofocus mechanisms require contrast in order to do the job. For example, if you point it to a blank featureless wall and then press the shutter release button halfway, you're going to see it's going to fail. It's just going to start hunting and hunting and say, there's nothing I can possibly focus on. Now let me show you this. We've got three horizontal lines here. I'm going to use the bottom one now. I'm going to put the bottom one right in the middle of that square and I'm going to hit the shutter release button halfway. Notice it's having a hard time focusing on it. See that blinking green light in the lower left hand corner? That means it can't find focus. Now what I'm going to try to do is turn this 90 degrees sideways and feed it a vertical line. Ha! No problem at all. Is that unique to just this one focus point? Let's try another one. I'll hit the center button and change it. Let's go two up and one over. And let's do the same experiment again. I'll give it a horizontal line to focus on right there. Nope, can't do it, blinking green light. Now let's try it over here. No problem at all. So the moral to the story is, this camera, all the pixels on this camera, all the phase detect pixels on this camera require vertical contrast in order to do the job properly. Will this ever show up as a problem for you? Probably not, because in the real world, it's not as clean, cut, and dried as the example I've shown here. Of course, I did that on purpose. Okay, so you're the camera, and you have more than one focus point. You've got a gazillion of them all over the sensor. Which one do you choose? How do you figure out which one of those to choose and identify your subject? Basically, the camera uses two heuristics to accomplish this, and to demonstrate it, I'm going to use two characters for this part. I'm going to use the, my old Ricoh 35. Ricoh is now the owner of Pentax, but in the olden days, they made some really outstanding rangefinders. Rangefinders didn't have mirrors. They didn't have pentaprisms. You would take the picture through one lens, and you would actually compose the image out of here. Rangefinders were famous for being very small and very, very quiet. That was the noise of a rangefinder. Let me put it close to my microphone so you can hear that. Up until the advent of the A6300, rangefinders were considered the quietest cameras you can buy. But now, with silent shooting mode, it's been superseded. Anyway, so that's one, and I'm going to put that 
over here. Next, my old friend, the Zenit, pride of the Soviet Union back in 1988. You can use it in Siberia in the wintertime, but I talked about this in other videos. I'm going to put that right over here, a lot closer. Uh, cool. Now, if you're the camera, you can... What it will do when you're focusing is it'll evaluate the distance behind every single phase detect point on that sensor. And it'll figure out what's the closest and it'll assume that that's the subject. So you have something close and far away, the camera will always select whatever's closest and that will be, and that will be the subject. Unless face detection is put on, not phase detection, face. The camera can recognize a face and if it does that, it will rec, if it does that, Here's a Sears portrait special. I'm gonna put that right in front of the further away object. And sure enough, if it recognizes the face, it'll say, okay, that's my subject. And it'll focus on that instead. So that's the two heuristics it uses. It'll either focus on the closest item, or unless face detection is turned on and it recognizes the face. And that's how it detects. That's how it figures out your subject. Okay, good news. How can we make it better? Well. Sony engineers figure out, we want to be able to do focus tracking, but being able to identify a subject using focus tracking was difficult in the early days. So what they did was they came up with a function called center lock on AF, which is ideal for movies. And it lets the user specify what the subject is. And once you do that, the camera will track it pretty easily. Here's how it's used. Now, in order to actually use this, you have to enable it in a menu. Camera, screen six, Center lock on AF, you need to turn it on. No problem at all. Then it gives you instructions on the screen. What it's essentially telling you to do is fill the square with your subject and press the center button like that. You notice the two white rectangles around it. You've now told the camera, this is my subject. I want you to track the subject throughout the frame, no matter where it goes. If you are taking a movie of a play and you want to just focus on that one actor as he crisscrosses the stage doing his monologue. This is a fun, fine example of what to do. Now, I'm also giving you a very, very easy example for the camera to track. You, what it does is it looks at the color and looks at the background and figures out, okay, I'm going to look for this kind of contrast wherever I go. Will it do as well in a complex scene where the subject and the background are not so cut and dried? The answer is, well, let's see. I'm going to move the camera to over here to a relatively complex scene, and I'm going to focus on this spherical type device over here. I'm going to invoke the same thing. I'm going to press the center button. The instructions come back up. Fill the screen. Fill a square with your subject, and then hit enter. And notice it, uh, it tracks something completely different, something with no color whatsoever and no shape, and I'm not too sure why I did that. Let's try that again. Maybe it's because it's backlit. Maybe this is a, an unfair test. Let's try it again. I'll hit the center button. I'm going to fill the square with my subject. And it's been fooled. All right, let's try something else. Uh, I'll try this purple cup. Cancel. Fill the square with my subject. There it is. Okay, now the purple cup is distinctly of a different color. So the camera will have no problem at all following that no matter what. Now, in previous incarnations when I did this, it would sometimes jump from one object to the other because it, it, in a confusing environment, it will get confused. But in a cut and dried one where your subject clearly stands out from everything else, you're going to be doing all right. This is a great feature. As I said, ideal for movies. Okay, how can we make it better? Well, the Sony engineers have probably said to themselves, what if we had it so that the user didn't have to get involved in identifying the subject. What if we did it automatically using the two heuristics that we identified earlier? Whatever was closest or whenever there was a face detected. And that's how Lock on AF was born. That's the very last feature you'll see inside your focus area menu. Let's go down the list here. Focus area Y, that means the camera can pretty much choose any face detect point at once. Zone lets you choose from a subset of three vertical stripes. Center is pretty intuitively obvious. Flexible spot, you can have either small, medium, or large. Expanded flexible spot, and then there's this one, lock on AF wide, which you'll notice is grayed out. You can't actually choose it. Why not? Well, two reasons. One, single shot mode is enabled, so I'm going to uh, invoke that to AF-C, where it'll continuously try to 
change of focus. That's good for when athletes are running to you. So let's try it again. Lock on AF. Great. It's enabled, and now you see the, the little tiny uh, triangle on the right. It's letting you choose many different options if you hit the right and the left arrow buttons. I'll uh, hit the right arrow button, and it cycles through all the previous menus you've seen before. Um, lock on AFY, the zone, center, flexible spot, all the options that are above it, you can now cycle through using the left and right arrow keys. I'm going to go with uh, lock on AF wide. There we go. So here it uses the same heuristics we found. It'll focus on whatever's closer, or if it finds a face, it'll do that. And then it'll assume that that's the subject and then track it. There we go. Now, no, you're not gonna see any squares involved, but you can see a group of squares that are kind of parading around. Let me actually uh, zoom in a little bit more and do that again. So this is how the lock-on AF works. It identifies what your subject is and tries very, very hard to track that subject. Even if it goes out of frame for a second, it might recognize it again as it comes in. I tend to keep this on all the time when I'm in AFC mode, uh, mostly because if you shoot kids or animals a lot, this is a really great feature to have. So that's a summary of the different focusing modes. And you'll find much more detail about each one and when's the best time to use each in my book, which by the way, I refuse to promote here. Well, okay, that's not true. This would not be a complete YouTube video if I didn't talk about my ebook for the camera, which many claim is the most detailed and enjoyable to read in the world of camera books. It's over 600 pages in length and packed with examples, explanations, and demystifies obscure functions like the S-Log2 and S-Log3 gamma curves of the video function. One purchase price gets you three different DRM-free formats, a PDF for your computer or iPad, a Mobi file for your Kindle, and also an EPUB file for all other e-readers. Copy them to all your electronic devices, it's yours. Also, if you like the way I explain things, you might also really enjoy the Friedman Archive seminars, which can now be watched in the comfort of your home by streaming video. It reveals the secrets of taking WoW-type images that the masters knew in the days before RAW and the days before Photoshop. Attendees from all over the world have said that they got more out of that presentation than they had by following all the bad advice they got from internet discussion forums in the last five years. More information is available at freemanarchives.com slash seminars. Thanks so much for watching.